Welcome back. In this lecture and the next, we're going to look at long-standing investigative tools that are available to law enforcement. The rules that govern electronic surveillance build substantially upon subpoenas and warrants, so understanding them is absolutely essential. This lecture starts us off with subpoenas served on individuals, and the next lecture explains search and seizure warrants. There are two basic types of formal legal demands. The first is for testimony. It's a requirement to show up and answer questions under oath. The second type is for evidence. It's a requirement to hand over some physical thing. In mangled legal Latin, these are often respectively called a subpoena ad testificandum and a subpoena duces tecum. It's just a difference in terminology. The meaning is the exact same. For our purposes, there are three main contexts in which subpoenas are issued. The first is when a grand jury is investigating possible criminal activity. As we covered in the last part, grand juries evaluate evidence before a criminal prosecution has commenced and largely act at the direction of prosecutors. The second common source of a subpoena is a law enforcement agency. These are usually called administrative subpoenas. In the federal system, the grand jury subpoena is the default. In many states, by contrast, administrative subpoenas are the norm. There is a third context in which subpoenas might arise, and that's after criminal charges have been filed, but before the criminal trial has commenced. In legal jargon, that's called pretrial discovery, or sometimes just a trial subpoena. Both federal and state authorities often make use of this procedure. The rules for these three types of subpoenas are generally similar, so for simplicity, the materials in this course mostly lump them together. If you remember nothing else about subpoenas, remember this. They are extraordinarily powerful. One common explanation of the subpoena power is that the public has a right to every man's evidence. That's a principle derived from Old English common law, which also partly explains the subtle sexism. The Supreme Court has again and again affirmed this basic principle of law. In fact, the Nixon in that last citation is Richard Milhouse Nixon, the 37th President of the United States. In United States against Nixon, the Supreme Court upheld a trial subpoena issued against the President. Nixon handed over incriminating audio recordings and ultimately resigned from the presidency. That's how powerful the subpoena is. Prosecutors can even take down a president. Okay, so that's the subpoena power. It does have some caveats, though. The greatest practical difficulty associated with a subpoena is that it can remove the element of surprise. When a subpoena is issued to an investigation target, it necessarily provides a tip-off. In response, a target might run, or they might lie, or they might destroy evidence. So there's a pretty big practical drawback to using subpoenas. There are also a few legal constraints on the subpoena power. First up is the Fifth Amendment privilege, which can prohibit compelling self-incriminating testimony. More on that in a moment. Second, subpoenas have to satisfy a reasonableness standard. We'll talk a little bit more about that, too. Last, statutory grants of subpoena power sometimes include restrictions. For example, the National Security Letter Statutes, which we'll discuss later in the course, apply only to specific categories of information. Let me briefly touch on the Fifth Amendment privilege. We're going to explore it in more detail soon when we discuss compelled decryption. For now, here's the simplified version. The Fifth Amendment can come up in two scenarios. The first, and most common, is when a person is compelled to answer questions. That includes a demand for testimony, or as we saw, a subpoena ad testificandum. In these scenarios, the Fifth Amendment works just like you've seen on TV. A law enforcement officer can ask away about criminal activities 
but the person answering can invoke the Fifth Amendment privilege in response. Pretty straightforward. Okay, there is a second way in which the Fifth Amendment privilege can function. That's where a person has been compelled to produce evidence, including in response to a demand for evidence, or subpoena duques tecum. In practice, the second form of the Fifth Amendment privilege is relatively rare. We're going to explore in detail when discussing compelled decryption. All right, so that's the super quick version of the Fifth Amendment privilege. Now let's turn to the other main legal check on the Sabina power, which is reasonableness. There are several sources of law that require that a subpoena be reasonable. They include the Fourth Amendment, the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, and some statutes that provide subpoena power. State law also regulates state-issued subpoenas, of course. Now, when courts assess the reasonableness of a subpoena, they can apply different standards. Some subpoena standards are fairly deferential to whomever issued the subpoena. Well, others are more demanding. Furthermore, the subpoena standard often depends on the type of subpoena. Grand jury subpoenas, for example, are extraordinarily difficult to defeat. The last high-level point I'd like to make about reasonableness is that, in general, it's a very difficult way to defeat a subpoena. The standards for reasonableness are quite lax. When assessing whether a subpoena is reasonable, courts often try to separate reasonableness into subsidiary requirements. There are three subsidiaries of reasonableness that I'd like to highlight, with the caveat that I'm somewhat artificially pulling them apart, and courts do very often blend them together. First up is relevance. There has to be some connection between law enforcement's purview and whatever the subpoena is issued for. The connection can be very attenuated, though. Second is the burden on whomever received the subpoena. If a subpoena is disproportionately onerous, then it can be quashed. Once again, it's very rare to defeat a subpoena this way. A subpoena can require an awful lot of administrative work. Third is breadth. It may be that a subpoena just demands too much. Breadth challenges are roughly a combination of relevance and burden challenges. Much of the information demanded may be irrelevant, or the volume of information may be excessively burdensome. Again, it's quite tough to defeat a subpoena this way. The way to bring a reasonableness challenge to a subpoena is simply a motion to quash. Some government entity makes a demand, and the recipient of the demand moves to quash. It's then up to a judge to decide whether to enforce the subpoena, narrow the subpoena, or totally invalidate the subpoena. Okay, so there's a crash course in formal legal demands served on individuals. In the next lecture, we're going to work through physical intrusions and how search and seizure warrants work.